Hello, you're listening to Kent Richard von Kuden, Hove Clergy. Today is Sunday, June the 23rd, and here's a couple of comments since my last video. While many of the NGO-sponsored vessels having stopped operations off the coast of Libya since populist Italian Interior Ministry Matteo Salvini closed down Italian ports, but according to a newly released report, two still remain and spend millions per year. German NGO Sea-Watch, which currently has a ship with 42 migrants off Lampedusa, uh, spent 1.7 million last year and 1.6 million the year before. In 2017, the NGO spent 1.9 million, including 460,000 to buy the ship Sea Watch 3 and another 380,000 to keep up its operational. Sea Watch 2 also, also was allocated 420,000 euro and a further 70,000 for Sea Watch 1. The NGO also spent 360,000 on a small aircraft based in Lampedusa used to locate ships in the Mediterranean. Sea Watch also spent 33,000 euro in legal fees for the trial of its captain of the Sea Watch 3, Piet Klemp, charged with aiding illegal migration. The other NGO still operating has a ship called the Mary Juno, which has received 100,000, which used 100,000 and has access to funding of 465,000 held in the bank. Also, the head of it is also under investigation for illegal, for helping illegal migration. More from that canary in the coal mine, that's especially for Emmanuel. Sweden, the Swedish police have done a crackdown on a Muslim leader and is due to deport five imams, starting with one imam and his 34-year-old son, who were detained in April along with another three picked up in May and are now going to be deported, including one to Chechnya. Efforts are being made by the police to get those who are a security threat deported in an effort to reduce the growth in extremism. Keep in mind that after the Sri Lankan attack, Sri Lanka deported over 200 imams that they believed helped or have information regarding the Easter Sunday bombing that killed 258 people and injured over 500, and this from a country with a population just a little over double that of Sweden. And yet again, it seems Sweden hasn't been culturally enriched enough. The Swedish parliament, the Riksdag, has voted in favour of making family reunifications easier and voted to extend a temporary residency permits order, which was enacted during the height of the 2015 migrant crisis, where up to 350,000 people arrived. Only the centre-right moderates and the social Demo Swedish Democrats voted against it, who also voted against the, uh, quote, so-called high school law, which had allowed thousands of Afghan migrants to remain in the country. All this even after the chairman of Sweden's municipal municipalities warned that the country could be facing a new migrant crisis that could rival 2015 due to so-called family reunifications or chain migration and expects over 60,000 applicants this year and, and causing an already strained system more chaos, forcing local governments to raise taxes as a result. In, also in Sweden, a 17-year-old unaccompanied migrant who was suspected of raping a very young girl, the daughter of the foster family he was staying with in April of this year. He admitted to having sex with her but argued that he was unaware that this was against the law, describing it as something happening between children and that it was, quote, perfectly legal in his country. The administrative court decided that the 17-year-old should be placed in special care for six months with immediate effect as the investigation revealed that the rapist was in fact over 20 years old and then able for a penalty of between two and five, between two and eight years in prison. In Germany, according to a new report from a Christian moder monitoring group, that between the 1st of April and June the 10th of this year, there has been over 30 anti-Christian attacks on churches, ranging from theft to arson and vandalism, including one where the church was attacked to the Bible and a hymn book was set on fire. On the 29th of April, the church in Mannheim, vandals smashed the doors of a church and other objects, causing over 10,000 euros worth of damage. Thefts from churches also include the nation boxes and in two other cases vandals attempted to set fire to the church but thankfully the blazes were put out before they spread and caused any 
significant damage. Another story this week about moral inversion and in a follow-up to my story about the Reverend John Parker in Essex earlier this month, in the UK, an Anglican vicar, Reverend Peter Hughes from Wearsley, has made headlines by stating publicly that LGBTI indoctrination of children at school is a form of child abuse. Based in St Albans Church, South Yorkshire, the Reverend published a three-page essay in his parish bulletin warning parents of the dangers, quote, the dangers posed by cultural Marxism. He also called the UK's proposed relationship and sex education programme quote, child abuse, for it misleads and frightens children into believing that there are a variety of sexes and they can choose between them. He also noted that Britain's one sexual reassignment centre for minors, the Tavistock Clinic, has seen an enormous rise in minors distressed about their sex from 40 in 2010 to 1,806 in 2018. Reverend Hughes also suggested that the, that the RSE programme, with its emphasis on sexual activity, is also a form of child grooming. He also warned that the RSE programme is about to become compulsory and respected the parents' stance in Birmingham, predominantly Muslim school, who protested about this, in contrast to the Christian parents of the same school who have meekly, meekly acquiesced to this and encourage the parents of the primary school that he is also governor to follow the example of their Muslim neighbours, stating that the LGBTI activists are imposing a sexual philosophy which is both anti-Christian and harmful and is nothing more than a Trojan horse. And now for some domestic issues. I was watching a stream with Gemma O'Doherty and Terry Lawton of climatechangeagenda.com filmed down in court down during the week about a phenomenon known as chem trailing or geoengineering. And I noticed that Mr. Lachlan brought up the quote by Mikhail Gorbachev, which was the quote I gave in my, May, in my 3rd of June video. On Saturday morning at about 5 a.m., I noticed quite a few trails overhead and using my flight radar app, the position of the planes were now over Wales and the Irish Sea. There was about five of them ran, running from horizon to horizon and one amongst them, a KLM flight from Amsterdam, travelling at 37,000 feet, that left no trail at all. That was the second time I've seen, uh, the second time I've seen that phenomenon when, when two planes travelling, one at 40,000 feet and the other at 35,000 feet, and one left it parallel to each other, and one left the trail and the other didn't. I've always been a keen observer of the skies, and may I suggest a look at the interview between uh, Mr. Ben Livingston and Alex Jones, a US Air Force pilot about the use of weather as a weapon. Uh, direct provision is making news again with both Offaly and Leitrim in the news with the councillors in both counties expressing anger of the arrival of asylum seekers at a number of locations without any notification with one councillor raising it at a meeting who described them as quote being parachuted into Offaly in in, you, in unused hotels and B&Bs and accused the government of turning Offaly into Mosny too. The town of Horsleep saw the arrival of 85 people and a similar number arrived at other Offaly locations. The councillor also wanted to know if any of the people had been properly screened for infectious diseases, importantly especially if anyone had recently arrived from Central Africa considering the Ebola epidemic and also a monkey out, a monkey disease outbreak as well. I phoned the councillor and had a very pleasant chat, and I emailed him some videos of Peter Sutherland in the House of Lords 2012, Peter Sutherland, in the, uh, Peter Sutherland and Simon Coveney in Copenhagen at Bilderberg 2014, and Simon Coveney and the Global Compact on Migration, none of which he'd heard of. I advised him to keep in touch with like-minded councillors and to watch out for any refurbishment work being done to build to going on any in buildings in small towns as there are concerns for Bolton Glass and Tullamore as being next towns to have it sprung upon them. Carrigan Shannon is also a former guest house turned into temporary accommodation housing over 30 asylum seekers which locals expressed disappointment and concerns 
that no prior notice or information was, was given regarding their arrival last Monday. The government has paid out since the year 2000 over 1.2 billion to privately run companies for accommodation with 72 million last year to an estimated 100 million this year with Mosny being paid 8.5 million last year and a total of 136 million since 2002 another company with centers in Cork and Waterford totaling seven centers got paid 7.5 million last year and 100 million since running mostly hotels as direct provision centers with the government stance that up to 85% of all asylum claims are now successful and the failure of the government to deport only 140 out of 1,400 people that were due to be deported in 2018. This madness will not be ending soon. Uh, I'd like to add in a personal observation this week. I was in Little and an Asian lady of Indian origin has spotted an African woman jumping the queue while an elderly lady was placing the goods from her from her trolley onto the conveyor belt and when the Indian lady brought it to the elderly lady's attention the African woman roared at her is it because I'm black and are you a racist to which the Indian woman very cleverly replied you may get away with that shite with the Irish but not with me uh, to which she moved back to the end of the queue so fair play to her and also this week the government has announced its climate action plan for 2019 that includes phasing out oil and gas boilers and to remove all petrol and diesel cars off the road by 2030 retrofitting houses to make them more insulated along with another 180 actions and claims to reduce carbon emissions to zero by 2050 with not my Taoiseach Leo saying that the quote government wants to nudge people and businesses to change their behaviour to tackle climate change I don't think Leo will ever have to worry about putting out a brown bin that's for sure with a population of 4.85 million out of a world population of 7 billion what effect can Ireland really have on climate change? My trip to Kerry in May of this year, where I drove 750 miles in five days, do you really think you could do the same journey by electric car? I would have spent most of my time of my journey. Instead of sightseeing, I'd be worried where can I plug my car in next. In 2017, the world's, provide, the world's produced 36,000 153 megatons of co2 one megaton being 1 million metric tons with ireland contributing being only 40 megatons this will wreck ireland's economy and deny its citizens the freedom to travel between be, travel where and when they want in an insane effort to reduce co2 levels especially when you consider ireland's co2 contribution for one year equals that produced by China in India in 14 hours. Imagine that. So with this crap going on, I think we're, we're on the risk of Ireland actually having another famine. And I noticed that last week I had 16 down videos, which is quite unusual. Normally you only have two or three. And I'd just like to add that I usually spend up to five hours preparing for this between writing it out and researching it. So I thank the, pers the people who put down the, the negative arrows and that I promise to do a better job next week. So there are a couple of thoughts which are my own. Thanks for listening. Good night and good luck.